Boom, we are live, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's your boy, Nolan Hawkeye Anthony here. And I hope you guys are having a fantastic week, wherever you may be and however you may be listening. Uh, today, I want to get into the panic level or lack thereof with Iowa Hawkeye football recruiting, since this is the time of year that we do uh, things like that. And Iowa's recruiting uh, class ranking checks in at about 61, and it's last in the Big Ten right now, although there are many, many more months to go. Uh, and we're also going to get into why Iowa is, at the very least, kind of slow right now when it comes uh, to recru uh, recruiting. But before we get into that, I want to mention checking out the YouTube channel. The support has been fantastic. You can type in Nolan Hawkeye Anthony. We're already almost up to 40 subscribers. I wish I would have done it way sooner. Honestly, I really <laughs> wish I would have uh, because who knows where we would be had I done that. Uh, and also be sure to uh, follow me on Twitter at 247Hawkeye and follow my man Dean here uh, on Facebook, Dean Freen. And Dean, you're still doing your YouTube channel uh, for the weight loss. How's that going? Going great. I just posted a new episode yesterday with some updates. Um, we're getting into the area where I'm giving some tips on what works for me and what doesn't. And so they, they can just search my name on YouTube and should be able to find them. Well, uh, by the way, folks, Dean has a hurt knee, so he's icing it up right now. Uh, he should be okay. I forgot to mention, go to 247hawkeye.com as well. All the links will be in the description. And I do think I'm going to uh, share the video more with Anchor than SoundCloud moving forward, uh, since there is a little revenue spot there. But you guys will still be able to find us anywhere you want on all the podcast sites, so it's good. Well, I have a little story to get into, and it, it's somewhat embarrassing. I wouldn't say it's the most uh, embarrassing thing in the world, but Caden Proctor, the number one uh, 2023 recruit in the state of Iowa, and I believe in the entire Midwest, not just Iowa, uh, posted a tweet after his Alabama visit and your boy here, there was a comment on there that basically uh, said that Iowa had no chance and I had seen. And so who knows folks, your boy may have ruined it. We may not get Caden Proctor cause I messed it up. I don't know, but uh, he posted something and there was someone who said that Iowa had no chance. And I posted a link basically stating uh, and the link was from an Ohio State writer that had a confidence meter for all the targets that Iowa was after and what school they were kind of leaning to. And I, you know, in my mind, because I am such uh, a huge Iowa fan, to me, when you are from the state of Iowa, and you play a position like tight end or you pay, play a position like DB or something like that, to me, it's a no-brainer. If you want to go, uh, if you want to play in the NFL, uh, if you want to win football games, if you want to have a good college experience, Iowa is the way to go. Long story short, Caden Proctor responded to me and basically said, uh, I'm an Iowa kid, therefore I must go to Iowa. And the, my answer was, no, you don't have to, but we do support you. And of course we want you go to, to go to Iowa. That's, that's what it is. Uh, and I did, there was a tweet before, uh, basically him uh, saying that, that the comparisons to Tristan Wirfs were not fair. And I responded and said, it's just people saying how good you are. It's not, you know, we're, no fans are actually saying you are Tristan Worst because let's face it, you're not. No, most people aren't. I mean, he is a top 1% offensive tackle in the entire country. I mean, he, after one season, he is probably at least top three offensive tackle in the entire NFL. Uh, and in, in my eyes, it's just, support it's just saying that you, you 
as fans, we want you to come to Iowa and we view you as that solid. Now, what I'm getting at is sometimes as fans, we can get caught up in the recruiting. And for me, uh, usually I don't care that much because when it comes to Iowa, um, when it comes to Iowa, they develop and they take lower uh, rated guys and they turn them into some of the best players at any position. Uh, so, and it's kind of like the NFL. I check in, but I don't uh, get overly involved. However, with Iowa having the 23rd ranked recruiting class, I've kind of got uh, last season, I've kind of gotten sucked in and that's just how it goes. But I, I don't think, I think it's okay to be involved. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have very little say so in who goes where and things like that. And it will be interesting with the uh, name, image and likeness. You know, when I was thinking about it, I thought to myself, well, this will open up the door for a school like Iowa tenfold, because if you can get paid for how good you are in the football field, well, it doesn't really matter where you go to school. Now, obviously, that's not totally true. But if you can get paid for your name, image, and likeness, going to a school like Iowa versus in Alabama, and I don't know for sure if a school like Alabama pays its players, but a lot of people say they do. But So let's say hypothetically that's true. With the new name uh, NIL stuff, you can go to Iowa and make that type of money. And, and there are boosters there that would, I guarantee, put down a lot of money for a guy uh, to go there. So, but I'm not sure how much things are going to change if a guy, if top tier guys are going to go more so to Ohio State or more so to Alabama. I'm not sure. Uh, my own experience as a, as a, uh, going through uh, having schools recruit me in water polo is not even close to what some of these guys uh, go to in football. So it will be interesting. Now, looking at this class, Iowa is ranked 61st. Now, I'm going to toss it over to you after this, Dean. And they are last in the Big Ten right now. And like I said, there's ton, there's still a ton of time. But I do uh, want to address a few things that some fans have been saying. And I think some people think that I have been critical of Iowa. Uh, and I even got a comment saying that what I was some of the comments I was making was similar to Nebraska fans. Now, at the end of the day, Nebraska has been at a certain level, and quite frankly, their fans should hold them to that level. I have no problem with that. I have no problem with fans holding a program to a certain level because that is the only way you get to said level. And for me, Iowa, if, if we look back here, I'm going to pull up some of the targets uh, that Iowa has gone uh, after the last two years. And it is important to note, and, and I'm going to look at the tight ends here. It is important to note that uh, the last two, so far, Iowa has missed on several re uh, recruits at the tight end position and two top 20, uh, uh, top 20 players at their own position tight end have come from the state of Iowa and Iowa has missed on both. Now, uh, I get it. One, both of them were lifelong fans. One was a lifelong fan to Nebraska. One, one was a lifelong fan to Notre Dame. And I get that. But for me, Dean, in my eyes, I don't think that Iowa should ever lose. Well, uh, maybe not ever, but they should rarely lose to Iowa State when it comes to uh, recruiting uh, on the recruiting trail. I just don't think they should. And, and I get it. Iowa State is, uh, had a good year last year. But, folks, who are we kidding? That, that was their first good season in years. It's been years. And if we want Iowa to get to a certain spot, we need to look at it like, okay, if we are recruiting against Wisconsin, that makes sense. If we're recruiting against Ohio State and we lose a guy, okay, that makes sense. But I am not ever going to say that it is okay to lose to Iowa State. And I understand context matters, and I'll get to that in a moment. But what are your first thoughts on that, Dean, with what okay. I've said there? Okay. I'm losing recruits to Iowa State. Right now, they're the flashy new kid in the pan. And recruits, 
love to go to the flashy new kid. Um, plus, they're picked to pick. They're picked second in the Big Twelve for this year, and so I think I think they're thinking that you know Iowa's not going to have a great season, and Iowa State is, so they they want to go there because they think Iowa State's going to be better than Iowa. Um, however, there are rumors, and I'm not you know, and it, it came from a, a media member that um, Iowa State may be negative recruiting against Iowa. All's fair in love and war. Yeah. And I understand that, um, but you should be saying what your program is better at than Iowa, not saying that, oh, um, Ferris is going to retire before your years are up or that, or they really haven't fixed the race thing over there at the school um, and that kind of stuff. You know, that's the kind of stuff that's supposedly being said against Iowa. And I, I see you're bringing up the quote that Tyler Barnes yes. um, said. And, you know, although he doesn't mention it, I think, I think I'm pretty sure we all know who he's talking about. This is what Tyler Barnes uh, had to say. And uh, before I read it, uh, my opinion on it is it's the recruiting trail. It, it's like the dating market. It is savage. That is how uh, things go. It Maybe it's not correct that that's how it goes, but nonetheless, that's how things go. And I do think that Iowa is sometimes too, they are overly humble in what they have accomplished because quite frankly, they have been a top, at, at the very least, five uh, a top five school in the Big Ten. But here's what Tyler Barnes said. The amount of negative recruiting I've heard this last month is laughable. Recruits Recruits, if a school has has to negative recruit nonstop against one of your top choices, stop and think for a second why they are wasting all that time rather than trying to show you what they are truly about. And listen, Dean, I get that. But as I texted you about this, at the end of the day, when a recruit hears a negative thing, even if they do not believe it, it is still in the back of their mind when it comes to looking at Iowa and it changes how they look at Iowa altogether. That is why I was such a big proponent at the beginning of all of the allegations. If it wasn't true, then you needed to stamp your foot down hard and say that it wasn't true so that you came out forcefully against it. But uh, outside of that, when it comes to uh, the, the recruiting, I do think it's early and I am not panicking yet. And it is important to note with Andrew Keller, the tight end out of Wisconsin uh, and Michael Riley Ducker, he said he, he, that he was an Iowa fan. I don't think he's as big of an, that he was as big of an Iowa fan as you or me. And by the way, folks, his high school teammate went to Iowa. Iowa had an inside track to get his recruitment. And yes, I understand that uh, Luke Lachey is a redshirt freshman. Josiah Meeman is a sophomore. Uh, Elijah Yelverton is, I believe, is a redshirt freshman. And there's only two at the max, two tight ends positions uh, for a school like Iowa to use. I, I totally understand that. But for me, Dean, when it comes down to it, you have the inside track. And I, I just don't know if I want to uh, make the habit of making excuses for Iowa swinging and missing uh, on the recruiting trail, especially when they were a top 15 team last year. Uh, you know, because once you make one or two excuses, you can make excuses all day long uh, for Iowa. Now, it's not over. Like I said, there's still a ton of time left, and Iowa does have a good start. They have a high four-star player in Aaron Graves. In my eyes, he's I think he is as good as A.J. Epinesa coming out of high school. That I mean, he's physically gifted. Uh, Iowa got their wide receiver and Jacob Bostic, and I just did a recruiting analysis on him. The dude is as, uh, is as athletic as they come. Uh, and all of that is great. And they have their two offensive tackle positions pretty much set with Kale Krogh, uh and uh, Jack Dotzler. And Dean, Iowa has been missing their top sales pitch, 
which is the culture of Iowa City, because I'd be lying if I said Iowa City was not a good time. It is. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. People who go to Iowa City love it. It's a, it's, it's, it is one of the best places on earth, not to mention the game atmosphere uh, for a, a game day experience for the universe, University of Iowa. You cannot simulate. You cannot simulate a night game at Kinnick Stadium. You just can't. And as Kirk Ferentz said uh, in this recruiting class, he said we would usually be further along with some of the cr- recruits than we are right now. And I do think that that is uh, I do think that that is fairly accurate. What do you think, Dean, on on, on all that? Yeah. Um, they have to get them on campus during a, um, night game. That is, that would be phenomenal. That would have to sell itself. And there's, it, it's absolutely, I am kind of concerned. Yeah, sorry, Dean, go ahead. And I was going to say, I am concerned that we're not landing our guys, but I'm trying to take a positive look at it and thinking, okay, does this say a lot about the young talent we have at tight end already that these guys, like the two top ends we just lost, does that say a lot about the talent we have that they don't want to compete for a starting spot against those guys? Cause I don't know, because I'm going to tell you the truth. These two guys would probably come in and take over next year or the mm-hmm. year after um, you be our one, two punch, be our, our Noah fan and our TJ Hawkinson. Uh, only because I think they're that good. I think they're better than what we have. So I find it hard to believe that that maybe that was what we already had waiting in the fold, chase them off. Because if Sam Laporta has the kind of season we think he'll have this year, hopefully he will. Um, he could be off to the NFL after this season. I think I think Sam Laporta is in for a big season. And to answer your question, yes, the talent is that good. Luke Lachey was I think the sixth rated tight end uh, coming out of high school. Elijah Yelverton was very high. I mean, that dude had more offers than Michael Riley Ducker did. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Josiah Meeman, uh, the same thing. I, I really think, Dean, what is holding Iowa back, I do think part of it is the negative recruiting. I do. Uh, but again, that is that's that's all fair i mean i can't really get that upset about that but what is hurting iowa is the non-existence of a game experience because when you have a game experience like a night game uh at the university of iowa what it feels the emotions that that it sticks with you that last for you know a couple of months uh are are I can't even articulate it. They are absolutely positively amazing. And here are some of the recruits that are still left on the board. I, uh, Xavier uh, Nwankpa, I think Iowa is going to have a hard time uh, getting his commitment. Although from what I've read, Iowa is at the very least in the top three with Ohio State. Uh, and I think maybe Texas A&M is the second uh, school there. I think Iowa will more than likely land Hunter Dale, the four-star uh, defensive tackle. And if they do that, they're in good shape. Uh, as I've said to you, Dean, if Iowa can finish a, as a top 40 recruiting team this season, with all of the stuff that has that has kind of held Iowa back, and especially if they can have a good uh, season this upcoming year, uh, in my eyes, things will be looking uh, fairly okay. So for myself right now, and I'm going to ask you, Dean, I would say that the panic meter is at about a five, maybe a six. I don't think it's great that Iowa missed on, on the two tight ends that they spent a lot of time with. And yes, uh, Brian Ferentz is a top five tight end, t- uh, tight ends coach, and he can take a walk on and turn him in to an NFL caliber guy. Uh, so that is important to note. I do think that Iowa uh, swinging and missing on two in-state linebackers was not great. Um, and I did tweet out that Iowa, you know, losing head-to-head battles uh, was not great, but. 
as with the 2023 commitment in, in uh, Maddox uh, Johnson, Iowa State was in on him, and Iowa won that recruitment. Iowa won the recruitment for Aaron Graves. So Iowa has been winning more than they lose. But how I look at it is Iowa should land three of the top five in-state guys at the very least, and probably four to five out of the top ten. Dean, what is your panic meter right now for Iowa recruiting? I'm probably at a six or a seven. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And I'll tell you why. Okay, tell, tell me. Why. Because even though there's a, still a lot of people out there available, Iowa is missing out on the ones that they really want. So now they've got to go back and find untapped talent that people don't know about and find those people. So they're going to have to spend more time looking for those people, people that can fit the Iowa way, the Iowa culture, who could be the Iowa Hawkeye, who's somebody who wants to be an Iowa Hawkeye. So yes. We're probably looking at guys that are going to have mainly mid-major offers or whatever they call that group. And now mid-major. Yeah. Or group, uh, of, group five. of five offers. Yeah. yeah the group, group of five. five offers. Those are the guys <laughs> that we're going to have to find guys that we can coach up because we're, we're letting a lot of power five type guys get away from us. And that's why I'm kind of panicking a little bit, but I, but the other part of it that, that gives me a little leeway to have a little hope, it's because Iowa does do a very good job of finding those diamonds in the rough. Diamonds in the rough. rough and coaching them up and coaching them up. Uh, Bob Sanders was one of them. Remember Bob Sanders? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nobody wanted Bob Sanders but Iowa. <laughs> That's crazy when you think about it, honestly. I mean, he yeah. literally became the top defender uh, in the entire NFL. And, yes, Iowa does find guys like that. And, Dean, here it is. Here's the top five ranked guys. Um I think the, uh, the, and again, Iowa can flip these guys, but I do think it's likely that Iowa gets two of the top five guys at the very best. They will get three of the top five. And if they do that, I will be okay. Uh, and you know, Dean, this is not a particularly great recruiting class out of the state of Iowa. And it, it most certainly is not like last year. So that is important to note uh, as well. So, folks, I'm checking in at a five or a six. Dean is checking in at a seven. Uh, things can change drastically next week. And it is important to note that Iowa received a commitment from in-state. And this is important to note for the entirety of all the recruiting because recruiting has sped up tremendously. Iowa received a commitment from 2023 defensive lineman uh, Maddox Johnson and uh, out of Norwalk, Iowa. And I do believe Iowa has five to seven offers already out of the state of Iowa in that 2023 class. I do think that that is going uh, to be a big class. And then, of course, Iowa has uh, a commitment in the uh, class of 2024 in Cody Fox. So just hey, hang on for a second. I'm looking at your page here. Does that concern you that he doesn't have any rankings anywhere yet? No, because it, this is, is too young yet. He's too young, <laughs> too young. They, they really only for a guy like this, they really only rank the top 100 guys, but in the next coming weeks, now that he has committed to Iowa, uh, he should probably have uh, a ranking. And I do expect him to be a four-star guy and I do expect the 2024 guy to also be a four-star guy and that's a great start it really is folks mm -hmm. it really really is and uh you know uh Dean what I'm worried about a little bit is that perhaps people will uh perceive this as um oh an overreaction but my answer to that is that's what we do and I do think we have been uh fairly uh most of our takes have been not only correct, but fairly even keel. I think, you know, we're very honest about this stuff uh, and it's uh, very important. All right, guys, be sure to go to 247hawkeye.com and I really hope that you guys share this out with your friends and family. It really, really helps out a lot. I'll give you guys an example. Uh, this guy shared out, I should probably find his, uh, his uh, name so I can give him a shout out. Well, I gave him a shout out last time. 
he shared it with all the Iowa Hawkeye groups and the video went from like 500 views to, to a thousand, just like that, that guy, just that one guy really made a difference. And at the very least like, and comment because me and Dean live all the way out in California. So mm -hmm. any, anytime we can get uh, a conversation in with you guys, uh, it is fantastic. Dean, I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball your way. I okay. wasn't going to uh, talk about this, but I do think uh, it is very important because of how well uh, this guy did uh, at the NBA Combine, Joe Wheezy Wieskamp. And it is official. He is not coming back to Iowa. And as I expected, as I suspected, he was actually highly considering coming back to Iowa. I don't really trust the Iowa media members. They've been wrong about many, many things. Uh, for example, Akram Wadley, uh, most of them thought he was gone. And of course, he came back. Same thing with Desmond King. Um, but Joe Wieskamp is gone. Uh, he made that announcement. And I think it's the correct one. I, I think it would be hard pressed. Uh, you would be hard pressed to, to put together a better uh, situation or performance than what Joe Wieskamp uh, was able to do uh, this past uh, week at the NBA Combine. And Luca Garza did not participate. But Dean, this dude has shot himself into the first round and probably at the worst early second. And as I you know, said to you many, many times, when he was a player at Iowa. And this is just how my mind works and how I look at it. When I look at a player's talent, especially offensively, I look at what aspects of their game do they check the box. And when I looked at Joe Wieskamp, he checked every box. He could mm -hmm. shoot the three-point shot. He could shoot the mid-range. He could shoot free throws, even though I think it should be higher. Uh, he could get to the rim, maybe not perfectly, but he could get to the rim. He could defend. The only things that he needed to work on and still needs to work on would probably be his passing ability uh, and, uh, well, really passing. Uh, that's his number one concern. But he does everything else really well, and he's a great teammate. And NBA uh, coaches and guys like that, Love a guy like Joe Wieskamp, a guy that can be a three and D type. I see Joe Wieskamp, D, uh, Dean, as a guy who can step immediately onto an NBA roster and average between eight and I wouldn't be shocked if he averaged 15 points a game, to be honest, uh, and give you very, very solid defensive minutes. Were you shocked by what he was able to do at the NBA Combine? No, we we seen flashes, flashes during games during his Iowa career of what he could do. I think all of us Iowa fans knew what he was capable of doing. I think the biggest thing we were frustrated with in his three year career is that he wasn't consistent enough. Right. And I think originally that was the knock against him is he wasn't consistent, but he's a good player. But he did show in that final game against Oregon that him and Luca deserved to be in the NBA. They took over the team when the other starters couldn't do shit. I'm sorry. <laughs> couldn't do crap. <laughs> couldn't do crap. So we're, we're not going to uh, be able to go on YouTube now. We're good. <laughs> no, we're, we're fine. We're fine. Uh, yeah. Hey. I mean, I listen, I would, I always came on and I would say that for those who thought that Joe Wieskamp was not an NBA player, uh, that was a good sign to me that you didn't know very much basketball. Um, I do think that most of um, those uh, sentiments were largely based on looking at Wieskamp and saying, man, this guy can score 20 a game. Why is he not doing that? Uh, and the reality is Iowa already had multiple guys uh, that could – in basketball, your role is really, really important. You have to be able to uh, fill your role. And listen, folks, I expect uh, Wieskamp to – I think he's going to get taken in the late first uh, to a team like the San Antonio Spurs. I, I've linked that team uh, to – uh, Luca Garza, that, that seems like a perfect fit, or like a Toronto Raptors. 
and I think uh, Joe Wieskamp will do fine. I want to read this here, just a little uh, knit and grit on uh, Joe Wieskamp here. Former Iowa wing Joe Wieskamp was one of the biggest risers following the 2021 NBA Combine. The six foot seven sharpshooter put together a great junior season where he ranked second on the team, yada, yada, yada. Following his NBA Combine, CBS Sports, Kyle Boone, named Wieskamp one of the big winners from the event. In the latest CBS CBS Sports Top 100 mock draft, Wieskamp is all the way up to number 36. And I, I think, I believe that is an early second round pick. I don't know for sure, but I think that's late first, early second. Um, Iowa junior guard Joe Wieskamp also did well for himself at the Combine, uh, uh, scoring 26 points, 10 rebounds. Uh, in his final game at the Combine, he also had a 42-inch vertical leap. Did that surprise you, Dean, the 42-inch vertical leap? That surprised me. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I knew he could jump, but not that high. No, that surprised me. It, it really did. I just, It's just crazy how you you think about that and, and just think about his how far he, up he could jump. <laughs> it, it was it really did shock me and on the flip side Luca Garza who a lot of people had going uh before Joe Wieskamp yeah guys I mean it was a big deal that he did not play in the NBA combine and I know uh that a lot of people say that uh that he already has plenty of tape but here's the thing uh had he, Luca Garza gone to the combine and had a performance like Joe Wieskamp, he would have been a, a lock to be drafted. And I'm not so sure that he's a lock now uh, to be drafted. I think he is. I'm, I'm pretty confident on that. Uh, but had he played and done well and showed that he could uh, compete with these top tier guys, it would have been great. And then I believe his, his vert was like 29 inches. I was a little surprised by that. I thought it would be 30, uh, 30 inches or high. I can jump 29 inches. Okay. Um, that's so, uh, we'll, we will see what happens, uh, with that Dean, if you had to guess right now, where would you say Joe Wieskamp and Luca Garza are going to go? I got, um, Wieskamp either late first or early second. And, um, Garza maybe mid to late second. I'm pretty confident that he'll get he'll get picked. Um, and the thing I think Wieskamp could make a nice career like Kyle Corver did of just sitting at the three point line and you know running down the court, yeah. somebody throwing the ball back to him and up and swish. I, I mean, think he could be like a Kyle Corver career. That's where I'm seeing Wieskamp right now. I totally agree. I think Kyle Corver is a great. Um, comparison and to me joe wieskamp is probably a better prospect than uh than uh than i'm sorry i blanked on the name Who, who's the name that we just used the comic kyle corver kyle corver <laughs> sorry i should have remembered I, I was a big 76ers fan to me joe wieskamp is a better prospect than kyle corver uh is uh and so by the way folks i i do i think that that is uh dean's wife in the background so just remember to say <laughs> hi uh and uh go hawks so uh mm -hmm. either way for the university of iowa it it will be huge if two guys can be drafted it would be that would probably put iowa to three guys in the nba and as we've seen with iowa state when it comes to basketball, it is a big deal to have guys in the NBA, which allows you to get higher prospects uh, and things like that. Uh, it, it, it's important to be able to say, listen, we can get you here and we can uh, get you, uh, earn you some money, quite frankly. All right, guys, I want to quickly uh, brush over this. I've seen uh, some, some places talk about uh, who they have as hot seat coaches going into this uh, Big Ten season. And a lot of them I don't really agree with, uh, or the lack thereof of having certain guys uh, as their on the hot seat uh, individuals. And the guys that I'm going to name, you better believe that they will be on the hot seat. And if they have a bad season, their time is running short. Uh, and I, I got to start with Scott Frost. I have to start with Scott Frost. And, you know, I listened to um, 
to 247 Sports Podcast occasionally uh, just to hear what, what they have to say. Uh, and the, the guys on the hot seat, he didn't even have, he had Jim Harbaugh, but he did not have Scott, a guy like Scott Frost. And that makes zero sense to me. Uh, and I, I understand the money that a guy like Scott Frost uh, makes and what it costs to buy him out. But trust me, Nebraska would take care of that in a second. Uh, Scott Frost, if he is not able to have, uh, in my eyes, if he can't have an eight, probably even nine win season, I think uh, he will, his time in Nebraska will be short. And it's not only the wins, it's, it's the recruiting. They will have missed out on the, t- the top five guys or recruits rather in the state of Nebraska uh, for the 2022 class. And that's just not good enough. When, when you don't have another school, like for example, Iowa has Iowa state. When you don't have another school like that to compete against, uh, that is a big problem. Another guy I would put on the hot seat would probably be uh, Purdue's Jeff Brom. I think he's had plenty of time to get it together. There's been some good stuff there, but there's been some stuff that hasn't been great. I would also put Jim Harbaugh on there, although I think his leash is probably uh, a little bit bigger than people think. But those are the three guys I would say are, are on the hot seat. I do think there's a little bit uh, uh, of heat for a guy like Paul uh, Christ to not have a season like he had last year or James Franklin. And I don't understand for the life of me how Wisconsin is consistently ranked so high when last year they were terrible and they have guys coming back. And what you'll see in the rankings, you see so many teams that are ranked because of their name only. If it were based on, if it were based on what they say it is, which is how they did last year and who they have coming back, Wisconsin would not be ranked coming into the season and neither would Penn State, but those two names certainly uh, give them a lot. Dean, I don't think you agree with me on the Scott Frosting. I I don't want to put words in your mouth, but we have talked about this before. Who in your mind uh, is on the hot seat and do you agree or disagree with who I put forward here? Okay, well, with Scott Frost, Um, I don't think he's on the hot seat this year. He might be next year if he has a bad year this year and another one. Nebraska typically gives these guys five years to prove themselves. So I I think he's on his third season or fourth season. I can't remember. I'm pulling it up right now. Here is uh, Mm -hmm. how Scott Frost has done at Nebraska. Uh, See if I can find the records here. This is his fourth year, and he has gone four and eight five and seven and three and five. Okay. So, yeah, I, I think he gets this year and then next year he'll be on the hot seat. If he has a losing season this year. Um, I agree with Jim Harbaugh. He was hired for one reason, one reason only that was to win big 10 titles, national titles and beat Ohio state. Ohio state. Yeah. None of the three has he accomplished. <laughs> And now he's got Penn State always knocking on it his door. It started off too. so good for him. Honestly, it really did. What's that? It started off really good for Jim Harbaugh. Now, not so much. Yeah, I mean, they had a lousy year last year, and I don't, I don't know what caused that. I, I don't know if, if the getting off the bricks, losing early in the season, that team morale just went downhill, or and just gave up on him. I don't know, but well, I couldn't think of a t- team that. You know, I understood why Penn State and, and Wisconsin took a no dive, but I do not understand why Michigan did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, uh, I, I firmly believe, uh, and we said it back then, but I firmly believe it now, that their Michigan not playing Iowa was a way to not put another L, a big fat L, mm-hmm. uh, on their resume and uh, it is pretty remarkable that Division One coaches uh, would do that because we, we always view them as, as highly competitive, uh, but we do forget just how, um, how much pressure is on a job like being uh, the University of Michigan's coach. All right, guys, we're going to get into the last topic of the day here. And, uh, Dean, I, I, I may have you... Uh, take the reins here. We are going to uh, 
this show, we're going to give you our all Kirk Ferentz offensive team. And uh, next week, we're going to give you guys our all Kirk Ferentz defensive team. And uh, the way we're going to do it is kind of, it's going to be a draft style. Dean gets to go first for the quarterback. Then I get to go first for the running back. And we can't take the same guy. We have to have different teams. And that is how we're doing it. Let's get into it, Dean. Um, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? I'm going to let you take the – I'm going to let you go first. Okay. For me, guys, when, when, I, when I look at quarterback in the Kirk Ferentz era, uh, there's – to me, the guy is C.J. Beathard. And, uh, the, and, and I know there's been Brad Banks. I know there's been Ricky Stanzi. But, but for, in my eyes, I cannot remember uh, a dude who took so little – and made so much with it. If you go back to 2015 and you see how many Hawkeyes were drafted from that team, it was only one, Austin Blythe. That team, uh, C.J. Beathard, took to heights we have never seen before, and it was really, really amazing. The guy was an ultra-competitive guy. He was cool. He was calm. He was collected. Uh, and uh, I remember – uh, Colin Cowherd said uh, that uh, Iowa had a fake ID and he used the fact that Iowa had only one guy drafted, which is low for Iowa. Iowa usually has at the bare minimum two or three guys drafted, but that year Iowa had only one. All right, Dean, you're up. Okay. Well, you took my quarterback, but I knew you would. I knew you would. So I, I, I draft Ricky Stanzi as my quarterback. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, why would you take CJ over Ricky? Um, I like the upside with CJ better yes. uh, because CJ used his legs when he needed to. And, you know, I've always been a proponent of having a quarterback who can um, use their legs. And so, um, Ricky Stanzi, all he had a lot of talent around him as well. A lot mm -hmm. of talent. Yeah, he did. A lot of talent. All right, you're up first at running back. Okay, um, running back. I picked my my uh, all-time running back. Number one running back is going to be Sean Green. <laughs> okay. Why'd you take Sean Green? Because Sean Green couldn't be stopped. <laughs> he, he, he got through that line, and he just kept going. I think if he'd had a little more speed, his power is what did it for him. But if he had a little more speed, he had got even more yards. I'm thinking, what did he have, like 1,600, 1,700 yards? I'm pulling it up right now. It was, I believe he had 100 yards in every single mm -hmm. game, which is uh, really remarkable. And if you remember, Dean, Iowa w was actually, uh, you know, they were kind of in a downward spiral. And uh, it, they, were, they were problematic mm -hmm. at quarterback, not in a good way. Uh, and you know, Sean Green, our, that last game against um, uh, who did South Carolina? I mean, he just couldn't be stopped. And I was a little bit surprised that he wasn't better uh, in the NFL. Uh, and he was a guy that Iowa was with at the beginning. Uh, and he had to go to junior college. Iowa stuck with them, and it worked out. He had 1,850 yards on his way. Uh, to the Doak Walker Award and 20 TDs. All right, guys. All right. I would say at running back, I would probably take Akram Wadley. And uh, th there have probably been guys who have been just as productive as him. Uh, and a guy that I would probably choose right behind him uh, would be Tyler Goodson. I think he's that good. The, the dual threat capability uh, and what I remember with Akron Wadley were, was that he played so big in the biggest games against Michigan, against Penn State. He dominated. He really, really did. Uh, it was too bad Iowa didn't have a better team. Uh, and I do think Akron would have been just fine in the NFL. Uh, he probably, he potentially could have got injured because he didn't weigh, uh, he didn't have enough weight on him, but he was incredible. And I would take, Running back. Okay, are we going tight ends next, or let's go tight ends next? Okay. The first tight end I would take, and um, it's kind of weird here because we're taking two, uh, and the two I pick are the two that you can't pick. I would take 
TJ Hawkinson. And all the stuff we've seen from Hawkinson after his collegiate career, uh, career at Iowa with some of the podcasts he's done has made me like the dude even more. He is a bro of bros. And I love that. I think uh, he's a really cool guy. I love his recruiting story. That's who I would take number one at tight end. Who you got, Dean? Oh, my number one tight end is Dallas Clark. Okay. I don't remember Dallas Clark uh, that, you know, uh, vividly or as vividly uh, as Dallas or as TJ Hawkinson, uh, but he was incredible. All right. You're first now at the other tight end position. Okay. My other tight end, this is tough. Um, I wanted to go with Kittle, but, you know, Kittle didn't do that much at Iowa. He right. didn't come into his own until the NFL. I'm going with Noah Fant. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to tell you why. Um, I think Noah Fant is one of the best tight ends to ever come out of Iowa. Yeah. However, I think something was going on that last season between him and Brian. I don't know what, but you, but I think we all know that for some reason there were games that he didn't get on the field very much. And there was a game, there's one game in particular, everybody wanted to know why, and Noah Fant to this day wants to know why, why he wasn't used when we needed to score. I think it was against Northwestern. Right. And, um, and so I think he could have got us a win. The, but the however, thing, yeah, but, go ahead. Know, that's okay. why I think he is. I think his talent is so untapped. It's too bad. He's playing for a team in Denver who doesn't have a real quarterback. <laughs> you know, when, when people were hyping up the guy out of Florida this year as one of the best tight ends or tight end prospects in years, I kept thinking in my head, no fan, no fan. The dude is mm -hmm. a perfect tight end and leave it to Iowa to find uh, a guy like him. And I mean, because he came out of Nebraska as a defensive end. People forget about that. Uh, the dude was fast, big. Uh, wasn't a perfect blocker, but he could block. Um, and I think what happened at Iowa, you know, he, when you have that type of hype and you have so many people filling up your ego, it is hard uh, to come back to earth, especially when you also have a guy like TJ Hawkinson having the type of year that he was having. And that is kind of, obviously Iowa probably could have used them more, but there was definitely uh, a few things and it was, you know, uh, it came to an end and he moved on. He got what he needed from Iowa. Iowa got what they needed from him and it worked out great. Since you took no offense, that's who I was going to take. Um, <laughs> I would, it, it's, I have to take George Kittle. And the reason being is um, as much as, I, this is a, an, an all Iowa, a.k.a. what they did in college at Iowa. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's impossible not to take Kittle at least out of the four that are uh, mm -hmm. mentioned, you know, because to be honest, Henry Craig Coble had a better season. C.J. Federowitz, who was doing pretty good in the NFL but had to leave uh, because of uh, head injuries had a pretty good uh, career. Kittle was injured all the time at Iowa, mm -hmm. but I would be remiss if I did not take George Kittle. Okay, next up, offensive tackle. Uh, and this is pretty simple for me. I'm taking Tristan Wirfs. Uh, you know, when he came out of high school, I was shocked that he was not ranked higher. Everything to me, showed that he was a high four-star guy he was a top-tier wrestler he went to the U.S. Army All-American camp and just dominated against top-tier guys uh, but you know of course the recruiting sites don't you know trust Iowa guys as much uh, and so for me and then he started since his true freshman campaign and only got better as he went along and he has Iowa's hand clean record now he's with Tampa Bay dominating. Who you got, Dean? Um, I don't know if he's an offensive tackle or not, but my next guy I wanted uh, from the line was Brian Balaga. Nice. <laughs> he is he is an offensive tackle. Uh, I, I believe he played in 2009 and 2010. Uh, mm -hmm. Brian Balaga is an excellent pick. He went in the first round to the Packers. He's had an excellent career uh, with the Green Bay Packers and a few other teams. Uh, and he is 
Uh, great. I do think you could choose Riley Reef or, uh, you know, a guy like that. But th those are probably the top two. The next guy. Oh, you're up next at guard. Go ahead. OK, um, I pick Eric Steinbach. Nice. A nice. Anchor that 2002 team that, quite frankly, without him and um, Bruce Nelson on that line, I don't know if Iowa has the kind of turnaround season that they had that year. Yep. Yep. And by the way, at tackle, you we could have taken Robert Gallery, but you know, there's some negativeness uh with how he finished his career. Uh, you know, he he was not most Iowa guys go to the NFL and do great. Uh he was a bust uh for all intents and purposes. Uh, and that is rare, but he was nonetheless. I'm going to take Brandon Sheriff. I know he played tackle at Iowa, but he is a guard. Uh, and uh, I, he's probably top three offensive lineman that has come through Iowa. He's one of the best offensive linemen in the NFL right now. Uh, I got to go with Brandon Sheriff. At the, since I'm first, the next guard uh, that I am going to pick for the Iowa Hawkeyes, man, this is, this is hard. Um, this is really, really hard. Um, I'm going to go with, uh, let's go with Sean Welsh. And that is probably surprising, but he is the only other high caliber guard that I have seen. I think he would have been drafted uh, in the first five rounds. There's definitely other guys that I could have picked. But I'm going with Sean Welsh. Who you have, Dean? Um, <laughs> this is funny that you mentioned this before. I guess he is a tackle, but I had Robert Gallery. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> Dean, it seems, is going with the top five offensive linemen just in general. Uh, but that that makes total sense. I'm uh, going with you... four, four, and I'm going to name the center. Yeah, go ahead. You're next uh, at center. Go ahead. Okay, my, my center is um, – I really want to go with Tyler Lindenbaum, but I took Bruce Nelson, who anchored the center, the center of the 2002 team, who was key to turning the team around. <laughs> Dean is going retro, folks. He is going retro. Uh, I'll be honest. I only know um, from – I am more in tune with about 2008 onward. That is more who I am aware, with, uh, aware of. For me, I thought Dean was going to take Tyler Linderbaum. I will take Tyler Linderbaum, but I was going to take Austin Blythe, uh, who is doing great in the NFL, was a great center for Iowa, but I will choose Tyler Linderbaum, who was selected as a top three player by Pro Football Focus going into next season. Uh, I'm not sure any uh, Iowa Hawkeye has had an honor like that, and it, it, it's incredible – uh, when you think about Tyler Linderbaum and Iowa got him, he was a four-star defensive tackle, and they said, nope, you're a center, and now he is uh, a top five player in all of college football. Okay, last but not least, we have wide receiver, and uh, are we going with two wide receivers or one? Two, right? Two. We're going to go two. Man, this is tough. Wide receiver is easily uh, the worst position that Iowa has had. Kelton Copeland is has probably done the best job at wide receiver. Um, for me, I would probably go with uh, Marvin McNutt. It, it, you, it's it's hard not to choose him. I I think that a guy like Amir Smith Marset has more natural abilities. I think Brandon Smith has more natural abilities. But what Marvin McNutt did at Iowa was absolutely incredible. So I'm going to go with Marvin McNutt. Who you have, Dean? Darn you. That was my pick. I okay, didn't who you got? I didn't think you'd go that old. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you forgot about him. <laughs> Marvin uh, McNutty. Okay, then my choice would be uh, Kevin Casper. Okay, nice. Nice pick. And hopefully his son chooses Iowa. I, I don't see why he wouldn't. And, man, is he a nice prospect. He's six foot five. Uh, he showed some highlights of him dunking uh, the other day. I think he could he could probably play tight end at Iowa. Truthfully, that's if he wants to block. Uh, Not but, only did that that highlight show him dunking, 
it showed his head over the rim and rarely do they get over the rim when they dunk unreal <laughs> unreal the athleticism and he's not even a senior yet guys he's going to be a junior and that is one thing that i say in my recruitment analysis videos is this is the biggest time in a man's life for growth is when they are about 16 17 18 there's still so much room for them to grow physically and mentally. Okay, you're you're first on the next wide receiver pick. Okay, this one was tough. I picked three choices, but I'm going to settle on Clinton Solomon. Okay. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you could probably figure out who my other two choices were. <laughs> well, um the, the only other wide receivers that are are left. I do think it, it would be fair if you chose uh, Riley McCarron or Matt Vandenberg, they had great careers. They, mm -hmm. they really did. Um, but I don't view them as uh, top guys, but the only realistic wide receivers that other wide receivers you could choose would be DJK. And I know right. he didn't finish, but he was a hell of a wide receiver and Amir Smith, Marset and Brandon Smith. Those are the only, only other three guys that you can realistically probably pick and the guy that i would go with man it's tough because in my in my heart djk it would probably be my next pick he was fantastic but i'm gonna go with amir smith marset since i already have a big receiver in uh marvin mcnutt i would go with amir smith marset to stretch the field and i do think uh, that he is about neck and neck, and his production is really, really close uh, mm -hmm. to we, Amir Smith Marset doesn't get the credit he deserves for for uh, the production he had. Our expectations were here; he produced here, but producing here was still very, yeah. very. Well, I think I think in his production last year was down because that's the way the offense designed it last year, plus the fact that. You know, um, he just wasn't one of the favorite targets for Petrus. Petrus had other targets he was thrown to. Yes. You know, and I, I kind of wondered with how many people he had the ball to throw to last year, you know. But, you know, you and I thought, and I think the fans all thought that Ymir and um, Brandon Smith would both take over and just have tons and tons of yards yeah. catching last year. They, but they just they didn't have an off season, guys, and an off season is mm -hmm. is big uh, to get that uh, that camaraderie down. It is absolutely huge. All right, guys, we are coming to the end of the NHA podcast. I thank you all for joining us. Um, I do want to mention because uh, it's just interesting to me. I've seen some people talk about. Uh, the the people who they expect to make the most profit with name, image, and likeness. And one of the dudes was just straight capping. He was lying. Um, he said that he thought that uh, that some of the uh, a few of the women's basketball players uh, would make a lot of money. And th here's the reality, folks. Um, the top, the only revenue producing sports at the college level for the most part are men's basketball and football and you are lying to yourself if you don't believe that a normal starter for the Iowa Hawkeye football team is not one of the most popular guys uh, men or women uh, on the campus. I do think Caitlin Clark will make, you know, so, some money, uh, no doubt about it. And I am happy that, uh, you know, women have an avenue to make uh, some money when it comes to uh, their athletic uh, gifts uh, in college. But uh, make no mistake, Spencer Lee, uh, you know, guy, th th those are going to be uh, the highest, uh, the highest earning uh, individuals, but, and we will see, uh, we will see, I don't think this is going to be perfect, guys. I really, really don't. I think a lot of people, because they want to be cool or whatever it is, want to say that NIL is going to be this perfect uh, uh, metropolis, but it, it really will not. In a, a year or two, we will most certainly uh, see 
some negatives from this, and it will be interesting to see how it goes both in recruiting and what the uh, players for the University uh, of Iowa are able to do. And last but not least, I want to come back to Iowa Hawkeye football recruiting. Uh, listen, guys, the panic meter is, is definitely up there, but Iowa has plenty of time to make it up. Uh, the recruits that they do have right now most certainly have a chance to rise up the rankings. Uh, and as Kirk Ferentz said, they will not just offer a guy just to offer a guy if they have uh, scholarships that they cannot get uh, in this 2022 class. They will roll it over to 2023 and just take more prospects there. And at the end of the day, the, the most important thing, especially with the transfer portal and um, – uh, I believe Joel Klatt talked about this. The most important thing is keeping, you know, thir uh, 13 out of your 20 recruits through the whole process, whether that's them leaving as a junior to the NFL or playing all the way to a senior, you need to have a good amount of your roster staying or a good amount of your recruits staying on the roster and giving back to the program and completing that circle. Dean, is there anything that we forgot to mention? Well, I just want to say, um, when you mentioned the transfer portal, I think you said it, but in a different way. Is the transfer portal should only be used to enhance your team, fill in some holes. Yes. You shouldn't be using the transfer portal to build your team like some schools do. <laughs> totally agree. That is an excellent point. Uh, for a school like Iowa, guys, it is imperative to just shore up some, some positions that may not have a ton of depth. But that is it, uh, and that is big time. All right, guys, I want to uh, mention going to the YouTube channel, Nolan Hawkeye Anthony. Uh, we are at 40 subscribers, and I thank you guys so much. Be sure to share out the NJ podcast, and at the very least, like and comment. It really means a lot to me and Dean uh, when you do that. Uh, and be sure to go to 247hawkeye.com. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, DBAP, don't be a pussy willow, and facts or feelings, because your feelings don't matter. Love y'all. Go Hawks. Bye.